Welcome to The Gold Exchange with Keith Wiener, where we untangle market and policy complexity using timeless economic principles. For show notes and archives, go to goldexchangepodcast.com. And now, on to today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Gold Exchange Podcast. I'm John Flaherty. I'm here with Keith Wiener, founder and CEO of Monetary Metals. On January 6th, Monetary Metals issued a formal press release reporting the issuance of the first gold bond since 1933. In today's podcast, we'd like to go a little deeper into the topic and understand why this is such big news, not just for the gold community, but everyday investors who are trying to figure out a way to save for retirement in a financial system basically devoid of interest. So Keith, you have written a lot about the nature of irredeemable currency. Why do you say irredeemable, whereas most people say fiat? I think they're they're looking at two different aspects of the dollar and of the currency. Fiat, you know, means, you know, force. The government says this is what you're going to use. And there's, you know, force of law behind that in a variety of different ways. Irredeemable isn't speaking of how the government imposes it, but of its nature itself and what the currency does. And irredeemable distinguishes it from what the currency had been previously, which was redeemable. So in a redeemable currency, you know, all bank deposits, including the deposits that support the currency notes, begin as somebody bringing, you know, gold or maybe silver, but uh, generally gold to the bank and then getting a piece of paper that says, okay, you've got $1 worth of gold and and dollar was a weight of gold at that time, um, not a price. Uh, you have one dollar worth of gold on deposit and you have the right to withdraw it at your leisure. Anytime you bring this piece of paper back, you slide this across the counter to the teller and the teller will slide back, you know, a bit of gold. And today the currency is irredeemable, which means it's an IOU. There's some sort of credit, some sort of wealth that the bank has of yours, and you can't ask for it back. You can trade it to somebody else, uh, but that, you know, in a redeemable currency, Getting a known amount of gold was a contractual obligation. It wasn't a price that was set in the market. It was, I'm giving you a dollar worth of gold. I have the right to get a dollar worth of gold back. And a dollar, again, being a weight, not not some sliding price. Today, if you want to buy gold, you go to somebody who has gold and wants to sell it, and you find out what the price is going to be. There's no way to know the terms on which you'll be able to do that trade. No guarantee you can do it at all. And the bank has nothing to do with it. So the, the bank has your wealth. And there's no way to to get it back. You're simply trading to, to somebody else. I'm fond of the anecdote that you share. I can't remember who you were speaking with, but it was some economics professor, somebody. You were trying to draw the distinction between currency and money. And I think you asked him the question. So back prior to 1933, when you took a, a dollar bill to the teller and you slid that across to them, what do you call the thing that they slid back to you? <laughs> Right. If the dollar is money, what is the money redeeming for? And uh, whenever I've asked that question, I've asked that question in a lecture in, you know, an academic context. And I was invited to to present a paper uh, a couple of years in a row. Would have been, would have been this year as well, except for COVID at uh, Juan Carlos University in Madrid. And, um, you know, the audience is, is academics and I've, I've given them that challenge. I have not yet heard anybody uh, come back with a, with an answer. You've also written a lot about the problems um, that results from an irredeemable currency. What do you think are its fatal flaws? So I I think there's two fatal flaws. Uh, I'm not going to go there where most people go and say inflation. I'll just say this, that um, we've had rising prices for 107 years since uh, the Fed was created. You know, if it can go on for 107 years, it can go on for another 107 years or another 1,007 years. That's not particularly urgent. A lot of people would say, well, inflation is a tax. And I would say, okay, fine, it's a tax. Right now, that tax is running around 2% per year. Uh, and that would make it one of the smallest taxes. I mean, sales tax in a lot of places is 8 or 10%. Income tax fed between federal and state can be well into the 30s. You know, inflation, uh, so-called, is not the big problem. But there are two big problems with the dollar. I, I think they're both fatal. Either one of them would, would render it unsuitable for use as a monetary system the irredeemable dollar, I want to be clear on that. And one is that the dollar being an IOU, if you pay a debt in an an IOU, so I owe you money and then I hand you an IOU slip, notice the debt does not go out of existence. 
I'm handing you a piece of paper that says there's there's a debt, there's an owing. Somebody owes somebody something. I'm handing that. I'm 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 slipping out the back door saying, okay, here, take this piece of paper. Now somebody else owes you. And you know, I can get away with that. That's how the law is written. But it doesn't make the debt go away, it just shifts it around. And so because the debt isn't going away when paid, as it would under gold, then the debt has to keep growing exponentially. Boy, are we seeing that in spades, you know, in the post-2008, you know, so-called new normal. The other fatal flaw is the interest rate is completely unhinged. So in a gold redeemable system, if the interest rate gets too low, then people can withdraw their gold coin. And by going to the bank and demanding your gold back, the bank is forced to sell uh, assets to sell bonds, which pushes the price of the bond down. And as uh, many listeners may know, the interest rate on the bond and the price of the bond are strict inverse. They're like a seesaw. If bond price is down, that means interest is up. And that's a rigid mathematical relationship. That's not a tendency. That's not a, well, maybe that'll happen. That's just the, how the math works. So you're, uh, by, by people coming and saying, I don't like the interest rate, cash me out. Give me my gold coins. I'd rather hold them under the mattress than continue to lend them to you at this ridiculous low rate. That forces the interest rate up. And so the interest rate in a free market gold standard is kind of like the price of anything in a supermarket. It's like the price of, of anything anywhere. If the price of steak is too high, uh, you know, you go to the supermarket and you find that sirloin is, you know, $99 a pound, what are you going to do? You're going to not buy it. And by not buying it, uh, then that forces the supermarket to mark it down. And so it's on sale. Now it's $79. And maybe one person buys it because they're desperate for steak or they didn't pay attention to the label or something, but they have to mark it down to a reasonable price. And then that's when the, the market will clear again. And it's the same thing with interest in a free market. But the dollar being irredeemable disenfranchises everybody. Now, if you don't like the interest rate, well, you're going to like it anyway, because tough. What are you going to do? So even if you take your dollar bills out of your bank account, and you say, well, now I have, I have physical money in my hand. That's not actually money. That's a that's a credit slip. That's a piece of paper that says IOU on it. It actually says Federal Reserve note, but note is an archaic word that means a credit. Uh, you're still financing the Fed and the Fed is still financing the government and the banking system and you're getting zero interest. So they've disenfranchised people and that means that the interest rate can go anywhere, you know, even zero, even negative, whatever. So I'd like to rewind in history a little bit and talk for a minute about John Maynard Keynes. It's been a few years, I think, but you wrote an article <laughs> called Keynes was a vicious bastard. Uh, it's one of my favorites. I think we owe our audience probably a dedicated uh, episode to Keynes, but I want to focus in on what he said about interest rates. What did, what did he want to do with the interest rate and why? He said drive it to zero or, or you know, quibbles maybe it says you know, slightly near zero. There's some managerial effort and talent you know, to, to find you know, the right thing to invest, but, but capital was going to be so plentiful, you know, he has this whole fallacious economic theory around it, drive it to zero. And specifically he said to euthanize the rentier. Now euthanasia, he's saying kill. So there's a particular category of people that he wants to destroy. Uh, and the rentier is somebody who's collecting interest on their money. Uh, and particularly somebody who's doing that as their source of, you know, primary source of income. So who does that? Well, that's a retiree. That's a pension fund who's paying retirees. That's an annuity. You know, when, um, when somebody sets up a cemetery, you know, how, what's the business model there? Well, you know, you pay X amount to buy a, a, a plot for, um, you know, a gravestone and, and a casket. That money up front, you know, a little bit pays for the services of the funeral director and whatever, but most of that is going into an annuity that long after the cemetery is filled and there's no longer new customers paying for new plots, how does that thing stay alive? How do they pay their taxes and pay somebody to cut the grass and, um, you know, put flowers on Memorial Day and so forth? And that's the proceeds from the annuity that they purchased. So by, by Keynes saying, let's euthanize that, he's saying, let's, let's kill that off and, and nobody should be able to live in retirement. And uh, further, he talks about overthrowing the capitalist order, destroying the sacred bond between creditor and debtor, creating reckless and wanton unfairness where some people are getting fantastically rich and most people are being impoverished. The people who are impoverished, impoverished will resent the people who are getting fantastically rich. 
Today we call it the one percent versus everybody else, and he and he's he's clever, and he says even their fellow bourgeois, right? So he's a socialist, so he uses that sort of lingo. The the bourgeois who are getting impoverished will resent their fellow bourgeois who are getting unjustly enriched, and uh, so he sees this as a way to oh completely overthrow the capitalist order and then bring about the you know socialist utopia that he you know, dreamed about. Let's talk about zero or negative interest rates. Aren't those just just the whole concept of a negative interest rate? It seems like it uh, is unnatural, like it would defy gravity, as it were. You know, to get interest on something is to get a uh, a return for for lending it out productively. And how how in the world could the person borrowing it then be entitled to even more interest for that privilege? I just don't. It's not computing. You know, that's right. I mean, in negative interest, that means you lend somebody $1,000 and then after taking that risk and locking up your money for whatever, 10 years, they give you back, you know, $990. Why would anybody do that? And the only answer is because they're disenfranchised. Because to hold a dollar is to be a creditor to the Fed. Ultimately, this is, by the way, why they're going to have to do away with paper currency or figure out some way to make the paper currency go down in nominal terms. Because if the interest rate's negative, then people will say, fine, I'll just withdraw all my money from the bank and hold it as cash. So they're going to have to deprive people of that outlet. But as long as people are trapped in the system, then they have to take whatever interest rate that they're, that they're given because there isn't any alternative. In gold, you can take your marbles and, and leave the sandbox. In the dollar, even if you have you know, paper cash, as I said earlier, you, know, you cannot... The interest rate has been falling, uh, as we all know, since the early 80s. Is there a problem with this trend? Well, yeah, because you know, it does two things. One, with each drop in the interest rate, it's now a fresh incentive you know, to buy a new flat screen TV, to buy a new car. So it's, it's incentivizing more consumption. Uh, and, with each, so, and, and if you resist it, if you say, no, I'm going to be disciplined, I'm going to be a saver, with each drop in the interest rate, they're taking away an incentive to save. I mean, at zero percent interest, effectively nobody can ever save enough money. It's a treadmill that's cranked, you know, so fast nobody could ever hope to get all the way to retirement and have enough money to retire on. And while they're decreasing the incentive to save, they're increasing the incentive to borrow in order to consume. And then every time it drops, the, those incentives both change again. And then there's another drop in interest rate, and another change in those incentives. So it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And then we blame people for being in debt. Now, people are still responsible for their own decisions. In a certain sense, I don't let anybody off the hook for just, you know, poor decisions they've made. But why would you design a monetary system to keep ratcheting up one perverse incentive and ratcheting down, uh, you know, well, ratcheting up two perverse incentives? The perverse incentive against saving and the perverse incentive in favor of borrowing to consume. Is there a problem with too low of an interest rate or, or even a negative interest rate as opposed to just a general falling interest rate? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I make an important distinction between falling versus too low. I, I want to preface my answer about too low by saying I'm not going to propose that there is a magically right interest rate that some central planner who is wise and disinterested and all, all, all seeing and all knowing like the eye of Sauron can you know sit down and say, and the magic right interest rate number is uh, 4.2%, just to make a nod to Douglas Adams and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But rather, if the market would have set one rate and um, the Fed and its dynamic ends up pushing the rate below that, then you end up with a whole variety of perverse outcomes. And so one, one of the problems economists have to answer if they want to have a grand unified theory of economics is... How does anybody know the difference between a wealth destroying and a wealth creating activity? And that's a non-trivial question. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious if, you know, a kid is running a lemonade stand because he has to buy lemons and he has to buy sugar and he has to, uh, maybe he hires his friend to wash out the cups and, you know, serve more lemonade, wash out the pitcher every once in a while. So basically he buys a bunch of stuff, he sells a bunch of stuff. And uh, if the gazauda is greater than the gazinta, then he created, he created value. And if he loses money, you know, then, then he destroyed value. And that's really simple. But when you start talking about long periods of time and you talk about borrowing capital from investors, suppose somebody bought a business 
in 1970 for $50,000 and today is retiring as an old man and sells it for $5 million. How do we know? I mean, was that a gain? Was that a loss? And uh, obviously with the changing value of the currency, uh, people would have to find some way of adjusting the dollar in order to be able to make those two numbers comparable. But that's the, that's the question after the fact. While someone's making decisions along the way, how do they make decisions as to what activities they should engage in and what activities they should avoid? And the answer is, it comes down to their estimate of the costs or what I call the gazenta and the revenues. Um, or so the other way around, the, the gazauta is the cost and the, because um, uh, that's money you're spending out the door and the gazenta is the revenues that come in. And they're estimating is, is it gonna make more money than it costs it to do? And one of the key costs in anything that's capital intensive. For, so forget lemonade stands, but now imagine uh, buying a, a 200 acre property and planting lemon trees. You're gonna borrow a lot of money to do that. Land is expensive. And then you're gonna pay all the labor to plant these trees. And then you're gonna have to carry that borrow uh, for a number of years. I don't know how long it takes from the time you plant the lemon tree until it's actually producing lemons, but I'm gonna presume it's not instant. Um, so you're gonna have to spend several years not producing anything while you wait. And the cost of borrowing, the interest rate, is a major determinant of whether this is going to be a profitable exercise or not. If the interest rate's too low, you're destroying wealth by something that is making money. And that is the most perverse possible economic signal that you can imagine. It should be the case that if you're making money, it means you're creating value. But by setting the interest rate too low, it can, it can obviously be possible to make money while destroying value. And if you make it profitable to destroy value, your civilization is doomed because this is what, you know, what large enterprises do, what major corporations do is they scale up to make more money. And if making more money means destroying more value and then you scale up even more, you're gonna destroy all of the accumulated capital that that civilization you know, created since, uh, since its inception and eventually uh, you know, collapse into ruin. So, so that's the, that's one of the problems of, uh, of, of interest rates that are set too low. So you see gold bonds as a way to get out of this mess. How will they help us out of this mess? So, so the first observation is when you pay a debt in gold, unlike if you hand over a dollar bill that says IOU on it, or doesn't say IOU, it is an IOU. If you pay a debt in gold, if you hand somebody a piece of gold, the debt is extinguished. It goes out of existence. And so a gold bond Gold is capable of not only financing something productive, which the dollar can do just fine. If, if I want to grow my business, I can borrow dollars and grow the business. So the dollar is financing the business growth. But the dollar debt, once created, is not extinguished. Whereas if I pay in gold, you know, the debt goes away. The, the debt paper can be torn up and um, debt, total debt of the system can be reduced. So the, this, this feature of gold being the extinguisher is one of the most important distinguishing features of gold. So how, how do you use this to get out of the system? So I said earlier, the debt in our system is rising exponentially. We're now approaching, you know, 30 trillion at such a breakneck speed that, you know, 40 trillion is the net, we're not even gonna talk about 31 or 32 and a half, you know, the next milestone after that's 40. We're gonna hit that in a surprisingly fast, you know, time period, it's a surprisingly quick time period. Obviously this is a problem. Obviously, when, when partisan hacks like Paul Krugman, who cosplay economists, you know, in the paper and on TV, uh, say, well, it's not a problem because we owe it to ourselves. I mean, I think at some level, even an eight-year-old can see there's something wrong with that. So we have this debt that's growing exponentially because that's how the monetary system is designed. It has to. If the debt doesn't grow exponentially, everything collapses. And by collapse, I mean the debt's wiped out. You wake up one day and you find out that what you had thought was money in the bank it's just zeroed out and your bank is insolvent or they just take away your bank account and give you some shares in the bank called the bail-in. That, that is what would come if, if the debt couldn't continue to grow as it needs to grow in order for all the debt debtors to find enough dollars to service their debt. That's the issue. If, if, they, if the debt can't expand, if they can't borrow to, to keep growing it, then the debtors start defaulting. Uh, and then the defaults will cascade and then the creditors become insolvent and they default on bigger creditors and so forth. So how do you pay off debt in a system in which the means of payment cannot extinguish a debt? That's the problem. 
And um, I would love to see, you know, thousands of economists out there asking that question and grappling with that problem because they're not generally. So uh, my proposal is to use gold bonds. And so I propose a mechanism for debtors, that is you owe dollars and uh, your normal, mo so take the US government, for example, your normal modus operandi is every time a dollar debt is due, then you roll it uh, by issuing new debt and the new debt has to be bigger because it has to pay the interest as well as the principal. So that's part of why the government's debt is growing. And then also, of course, it's spending, spending in a way that to make a, a drunken sailor look you know, prudent by comparison. So you say, okay, we're going to issue a gold bond, but here's the, here's the twist. The gold bond is not going to be, uh, we don't want people to pay in dollars. If we want to raise more dollars, we'll just sell a regular dollar bond. Nor are we asking people to pay in gold for this particular gold bond. Now, monetary metals, we just did a gold bond and the investors invested in gold. But what I'm talking about here is a mechanism for getting out of debt, not financing a mining company. So um, instead of paying in gold, we tell the investors in this new gold bond, we want you to pay in outstanding, we want you to tender our outstanding paper debt. So it's a redemption exercise. How much paper debt will you bring back to us to redeem in exchange for which you're gonna get this new gold denominated debt? So, so observe what this does. Uh, first of all, it's giving the investors a choice. Suppose you had a choice of, would you like to be paid back 100 ounces in 10 years, in 23rd, January of 2031? Or would you like to be paid $190,000 in January of 2031? Well, it's pretty obvious. And when we ask, you know, even non-gold people that choice, it's pretty obvious which one is preferable. The Fed is, you know, working away to debase the dollar. The dollar has a lot of uncertainty in it and uh, gold does not. And so over long periods of time, it's pretty clear that gold is the better bet. So now people can, people have a preference that they'd rather get paid in gold at the end rather than dollars. And now they have a way of expressing that. Would you prefer to um, hold the dollar bonds of, of the U.S. Treasury or given it's the same debtor and the same credit risk, would you prefer that they pay you gold in the end? And so I think that will be a pretty strong preference, which means the exchange rate between the treasury bond paper version versus the treasury bond gold version will tilt in favor of the gold one, which means that people will have to bring more than a hundred ounces worth of paper bonds in order to redeem, uh, I shouldn't say redeem, in order to uh, exchange for the equivalent dollar amount in, um, uh, it's the equivalent, equivalent gold amount. The net result of which is that the government can get out of debt at a discount, but more importantly, by getting rid of a debt that cannot be extinguished, only serviced, for a debt that can be extinguished, then if you keep iterating this process over and over and over again, eventually the government could actually pay off its debts. Now, this is really important because the entire financial system and all the financial intermediaries, that's not just banks. It's credit unions, it's pension funds, it's insurance companies, it's annuities, and many other kinds of financial intermediaries. Uh, it's important that they be repaid in nominal terms. If they're not repaid in nominal terms, they're insolvent themselves. And so you destroy the entire financial system, which is, is going to be horrific. We don't want to do that. If you can pay them back in nominal terms, I say nominal terms, the value of what they're being paid back in is lower. But on their balance sheet, they have a debt and they have, they, they, you know, they have a liability, which is what they owe somebody else. And then they have an asset, which is what the government or some other debtor owes them. The balance sheet doesn't really change if the value of the dollar is higher or lower. What matters is that they're repaid in nominal terms so that they can repay their creditors. And so by issuing a gold bond with this twist, this mechanism that buyers of the bond have to tender outstanding paper bonds of the same issuer, it creates a mechanism by which the debt can be, uh, you know, finally settled and repaid. You know, we can, we can close this chapter and move on to a more honest monetary system. So if I might just restate in my own words, um, the gold bonds provide a way uh, to solve the fatal flaw of fiat currency, which is make it redeemable. And then also for in terms of a benefit to savers, they now have a means of earning interest on their hard-earned wealth. 
and uh, preparing for retirement, which is something that, uh, you know, right now we're, we're a nation of speculators in the absence of, of interest. Do I have that right? That's right. Although I would say the fatal flaw of irredeemable currency rather than of fiat currency per se. That's right. Although, you know, it, to me, those concepts are like precision and accuracy. Mm -hmm. If I say here, I have a calipers that's highly accurate. Chances are it's also highly precise. Nobody spends the money to achieve great accuracy and fails to achieve precision. So accuracy and, and precision are, are very related concepts and fiat and irredeemable are related, but, uh, but differentiated as I, as I said earlier, but yeah, otherwise I, I agree hundred percent with what you said. So final question, why should investors consider these bonds when they've enjoyed such a stellar, such a stellar return or stellar returns in the stock market, uh, these many decades? You know, it's a good question. And, um, the answer that I'm not going to give is that, you know, the stock market has to crash. It's a fake stock market. It's fake prices. It's fake valuation. Uh, it's not, that's the answer I won't give. It certainly tends to be the case that as our system is, is gyrating and, and, you know, having to go off the rails, they tend to be punctuated by these very sharp crashes. But I think the bigger issue is you have to look at what stage of life you're in and how much risk you can take of a big, of a big drawdown. You know, so somebody who's 21 years old just started their career. First of all, they don't usually have a lot of money. So if they have $5,000 of savings by that point, I guess that's pretty good. And uh, if they want to gamble that in the stock market, okay, fine. And then if they lose it, well, now they're 21 and a half and, um, you know, lesson learned and, and they, you know, have their whole career ahead of them to earn more. But if you're 70, 70 plus years old, you know, a big drawdown, you don't have time to wait, you know, for things to recover. But I think more broadly, the difference between, and this is an economics principle, the difference between earning interest on an investment versus making a capital gain on a speculation is the source of where the, the profits of the investor come from. In the case of earning interest, you're financing something productive and something new, something that isn't being produced right now. So you're enabling something new to come to market, which is a good thing and everybody benefits from that. And your, pro your profit comes from part of the profit from, from that new production. So, you, you know, something new is being created and you get a piece of the new thing that was created because you're the one who financed it. In the case of speculation, nothing new is being created. Um, your profit comes from the next speculator who's forking over a bit of his life savings uh, to you to buy the asset and that his savings come to you as income. So nobody, nobody wants to be the prodigal son. Nobody wants to spend their own life savings or their own family legacy, but they're happy to spend income. And if someone else's family legacy comes to you as your income, you don't know that you don't care that and you spend it. Now that person forked that over to you because he's expecting the next speculator to fork over even more wealth to him. And so it's not that the wealth is destroyed when the stock market crashes. Everybody can understand the pain when the stock market goes, you know, down by 50% or 80%. It's that wealth is being destroyed bit by bit on the way up. It should be obvious again to that precocious eight year old whole generations can't possibly get rich by speculating on stock market prices. I mean, that, that should just be an iron law of reality that if everybody is just putting money in and things are going up and up and up and up and up, that there's not a net increase in wealth from this. That should be just, just an axiom of financial markets that, okay, uh, you know, one person is giving up his wealth exchange for this asset, it's going to go up and then someone else, but eventually, you know, you run out of available wealth to destroy through that process. Even if the stock market doesn't crash immediately, you're participating in that process. You know, I would argue people should think about these things at a principled level and then, you know, ask how much participation they want in, in something like that. Great. Keith, this has been a great discussion today. Lots of good food for thought with regards to these bonds. Thank you for joining us on the Gold Exchange. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Go to goldexchangepodcast.com to learn how you can earn a yield on gold paid in gold.